Clement of Alexandria said, It is with a different kind of spell that art deludes you. It leads you to pay religious honor and worship to images and pictures. Now try to imagine an Orthodox priest saying that. That art deludes you because it leads you to give religious honor and worship to images. Is there any context in which an Orthodox apologist would say such a thing? And notice that Clement isn't just talking about worship here, but he's talking about giving honor as well. Clement also said that, quote, the law itself exhibits justice. It teaches wisdom by abstinence from visible images and by inviting us to the maker and father of the universe. Abstinence from visible images. Can you imagine a Catholic apologist saying that? Somebody could say, well, Clement is just talking about abstaining from images of God himself, not from images of Jesus or of Mary or saints or angels. Okay, maybe, I guess you could make that work if you want to. Clement has more to say, though. Quote, works of art cannot be sacred and divine. Do you agree with Clement? Do you agree with this second century apologist who was entrusted by the church to represent them to the world that works of art cannot be sacred and divine? Irenaeus, a very important second century defender of the church, says something extremely interesting about the Gnostics. Quote, they call themselves Gnostics. They also possess images some of them painted, and others formed from different kinds of materials. They maintain that a likeness of Christ was made by Pilate at the time when Jesus lived among them. They crown these images and set them up along with the images of the philosophers of the world. That is to say, they place them with the images of Pythagoras, Plato, Aristotle, and the rest. They have also other modes of honoring these images after the same manner of the Gentiles. So the Gnostics, a heretical Christian sect, had this practice of crowning images, including images of Jesus. They were honoring images of dead human philosophers and other things they did that Irenaeus says were, quote, after the manner of the Gentiles. The Gnostics got this practice from the Gentiles, according to Irenaeus. Well, this would have been a great time for Irenaeus to say something like, Now, we Christians do something very similar, but we do it with Christian saints that have passed away, and with Mary, and with angels, and with the Lord Jesus, not with false gods or pagan philosophers. It would be really important for Irenaeus to say something like that in order to avoid giving people the impression that using images in, in, in this kind of way is bad in any context. right? He, he wouldn't want to give that impression, not if he himself was venerating images in the context of Christian worship. So he doesn't appear to have felt the need to make the distinction between the pagan or Gnostic practice of using images, and the Christian practice of using images. And I think the reason he didn't make that distinction is because the Christians didn't use images at this point in history. So far, do you get the sense that these guys would be on the same page with the Orthodox and the Catholics on this issue? Here's one from Cyprian, moving into the third century now. Cyprian said the following, quote, The pagan gods were once kings, but on account of their royal memory, they subsequently be began to be adored by their people even in death. 
Afterward, images were sculptured to retain the faces of the deceased by the likeness. Later, men sacrificed victims and celebrated festal days to give them honor. Finally, those rites became sacred. So it was definitely a pagan and a Gnostic practice to use images to honor the deceased. That's very clear in what some of these guys have to say. Okay, the following quotes are interesting because in them you have early Christians talking about how the pagans explained and rationalized their use of images in worship. This is very interesting. Athenagoras, who was in the late 2nd century, said, quote, It is asserted by some pagans that although these are only images, yet there exist gods in honor of whom they are made. They say that the prayers and sacrifices presented to the images are to be referred to the gods and are in fact made to the gods. So you see what he's saying. The pagans paid honor to images that represented their gods, and they explained that they were not actually worshiping or praying to or sacrificing to the image itself, but to the god that it represents. Here are two more quotes. First, Lactantius, early 4th century, talking about pagans, says, quote, What madness it is then, either to form those objects that they themselves may afterwards fear, or to fear the things that they have formed. However, they say, We do not fear the images themselves, but those beings after whose likenesses they were formed, and to whose names they are dedicated. And then Arnobius, also early 4th century, says to the pagans, Quote, you pagans say, but you err and are mistaken, for we do not consider either copper, gold, silver, or those other materials of which statues are made to be in themselves gods and sacred deities. Rather, in them we worship and venerate those beings whom their dedication as sacred items cause to dwell in those statues made by workmen. So does this reasoning that the pagans used, does that sound familiar? Have you listened to Orthodox apologists explain things in a very similar way, but, but just with Jesus and Mary and angels and saints, instead of with pagan gods? That we're not paying respect or honor to the icon itself, but to the one it represents. Where did that line of reasoning come from? It sounds like the early Christians, like Lactantius and Arnobius, were talking to the pagans about this practice they had and trying to reason with them, and that the pagans used the same kind of explanation and logic to defend their practice that the Orthodox and Catholics use to defend their practice today. And Lactantius, in another place, he reasoned with the pagans and said, Why do you look at some piece of wood that's hanging on a wall when you can raise your eyes up to heaven? And I'm paraphrasing, obviously. If he himself, Lactantius, had been venerating wooden icons of Jesus and Mary and the saints, it would have made more sense for him to tell them to start doing this in the right context. You know, start venerating the right the right people and, and in the right way, you know, come, come turn to the, to the true God and come, come with us and, and then you can venerate the right images. But Lactantius seems to just criticize the practice of using images itself, as do the others. Now I'm going to read a few quotes from both Tertullian and Origen. And I realize that Catholics and Orthodox have problems with these guys because of some of the weird ideas and heresies that they got mixed up with at some point. But you can't just ignore the things they said about this issue, especially if they're simply saying the same kind of thing that all these other guys were saying, which they do. So let's not be inconsistent. 
is I've had conversations with Catholics about nonviolence. And when I brought up things that Origen and Tertullian said about this topic, they say, well, those guys taught some heretical things, so we don't take them too seriously. But then you go on a Catholic website and read about, you know, apostolic succession, and the article is quoting Origen and Tertullian. And I think that's a bit selective. Tertullian wrote some of his most important stuff on the Trinity after he became a Montanist, if I'm not mistaken. And I believe he coined the term Trinity after becoming a Montanist as well. Um, but Catholics and Orthodox don't toss out his teachings on that subject just because he was wrong in other areas of his, the of his theology. But what matters is that his teaching on the Trinity was consistent with what the Church as a whole taught and affirmed. And, 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 and that's true here as well. Now here's Tertullian, and he says these things before he became a, a Montanist, by the way. Not, not that that matters too much, but notice that he doesn't say that this is what he thinks, but this is what we think. He's representing what Christians believe here. Tertullian says, quote, We know that the names of the dead are nothing, as are their images. But when images are set up, we know well enough, too, who carry on their wicked work under these names. We know who exult in the homage rendered to those images. We know who pretend to be divine. It is none other than accursed spirits. And in, an, in another place, Tertullian said, Not that an idol is anything, as the Apostle says, but the homage they render to it is to demons. These are the real occupants of these consecrated images, whether of dead men or, as they think, of gods. And Tertullian also said the following, quote, Demons have their abode in the images of the dead. Scary. So this is how he learned to think about all this as a Christian and as a Christian apologist. Now, uh, Origen is important on this issue because in some of what he said, he was responding to a criticism from the, Rome, the, uh, the Roman Celsus, who had said the following about the Christians, quote, they cannot tolerate temples, altars, or images. And Kelsa says that the Christians cannot to tolerate images just like the Scythians do not tolerate images. And the Scythians were a non-Christian group that also wanted nothing to do with, with images, apparently. And Kelsa lumps the Christians in with them because they have that in common. And this is very significant because, of course, nobody would ever accuse Catholics or Orthodox Christians of not being able to tolerate images, but this was how he was criticizing, criticizing Christians in his day. And Origen's response is very important. Does he say, no, no, Celsus, we, we tolerate images. Come to my church gathering and you'll see images of Jesus and Mary and Ignatius and Polycarp and all the other saints and the angels? No, here's what he says to Celsus. Quote, to this, our answer is that if the Scythians cannot bear the sight of temples, altars, and images, it does not follow that our reason for objecting to these things is the same as theirs, even though we cannot tolerate them any more than they can. The Scythians, the nomadic Libyans, the godless Ceres, and the Persians agree in this with the Christians and the Jews. However, they are actuated by very different principles. For none of these other groups abhor altars and images on the ground that they are afraid of degrading the worship of God and reducing it to the worship of material things. It is not possible at the same time to know God and to address prayers to images. Is there any context in which an Orthodox priest would say something like that? That Christians reject images just like other groups who reject them. 
but only for a different reason. Origen also said that, quote, image making is an art that attracts the attention of foolish men. It drags the eyes of the soul down from God to earth. The Orthodox say that images are like a window into heaven, that they draw your attention up to God and Jesus and the heavenly realm. And Origen is saying, no, images actually draw your eyes down from heaven to things on earth. Instead of lifting your eyes and your heart up to the invisible God and to the real Jesus who is sitting at God's right hand, I'm trying to venerate Jesus through a piece of wood or a piece of canvas, a lifeless thing. And I think it's a good point that Origen is making. The real presence of God and of Jesus can be with you in the room and within you through the Holy Spirit. You can address Him directly. You don't have to look at a picture of Jesus. Do not the Orthodox and Catholics believe that God and Jesus are really present through the Holy Spirit with those who love God? I know they, 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 they believe that. So why would, we, why would we need a picture? How does Jesus think about someone talking to him through a picture? Imagine you're sitting next to your friend right there with them in the room, but they're looking at a picture somebody drew of you and talking to it, and you're thinking, hey, I'm, I'm right here. Why are you talking to that thing? I'm, I'm right here. It's just something to think about. I can see both perspectives. I, can, I, I see what Origen is saying, and I, I resonate with that more. But I can understand how an Orthodox Christian would feel differently about this. They feel that venerating icons draws their attention up to heaven, and that it helps them to connect more with the spiritual realm. But the important thing is not which of these perspectives feels more right to us. It's which one is more like the position of the apostolic church. And there are other quotes from the pre-Nicene church, and they all say this kind of thing. Nobody teaches that Christians venerate images in these first three centuries. Nobody. It's not there. I watched a video on an Orthodox YouTube channel called Theoria, which is pretty popular. It's got uh, you know many, many thousands of subscribers, and uh, it has all this Orthodox apologetic content. And this particular video I watched is called, Are Icons Idols Responding to J.I. Packer's Iconoclasm? And around the six-minute mark, the creator of the video begins to talk about how the dominant view of the church throughout history has been to embrace icons, and that a total rejection of icons is really the result of influence from heresies like Gnosticism and Docetism. Really? Rejection of icons comes from Gnostic influence? According to Irenaeus, some Gnostics had images of Jesus, including images that they crowned along with images of Greek philosophers. I'm not sure why he thinks that. Anyway, the creator of the video goes on to say that the rejection of images was not a mainstream Christian position, but that, quote, the most widely accepted valid historical witnesses to Christianity wrote favorably about icons, end quote. And then, in, in this video, a short list of church teachers appears on the screen. And the list includes Athanasius the Great, Ambrose of Milan, Basil the Great, Gregory the Theologian, John Chrysostom, Jerome, all these people are 4th and 5th century Christians. Why doesn't the Orthodox apologist cite any 2nd or 3rd century Christians? That would really strengthen his argument. That would make the video much more compelling and powerful. Why doesn't he put any names from, from those earlier centuries in there? It's because there aren't any of them from that time period who supported his view. If there were, he cer certainly would have put them on the list. See, he has the same problem with icons 
that many Christians today have with just war theory, or that Calvinists have with their soteriology. You try to ground these teachings historically, but you hit a wall in the 4th or 5th century. You can't find any support from the church prior to that. You can't, you can't get back to the apostles with it. And it doesn't matter if your view on something is the dominant view of the church today or even for most of church history. Just war theory has been the dominant view of most Christians for most of church history. That does absolutely nothing to show that it's the right view or the historic view. What matters is what, what was taught in the beginning. So in light of all this, doesn't it seem likely that icon veneration is a pagan corruption that got into the church at some point around the 4th century when the church fused with Rome and when pagans began to flood the church? Doesn't that make sense? If we're being objective, you know, and just open to wherever the evidence leads us. In the 2nd and 3rd century, you have the perspective of the Christians that I just quoted. In the 4th century is where you begin to get different perspectives on this issue. You have the Council of, of Elvira, which happened between 300 and 310 AD. There were 19 bishops and 24 priests at, at that council. And Canon 36 of the Council of Elvira says, quote, There shall be no pictures in churches, lest what is venerated and adored be depicted on the walls. And then you have Eusebius, who was a 4th century Christian historian and one of Constantine's advisors. And he was asked by Constantine's half-sister for an image of Jesus. And Eusebius answered, To depict purely the human form of Christ before its transformation, on the other hand, is to break the commandment of God and to fall into pagan error. But then you have people like Basil of Caesarea and others later on in the 4th century who did support the practice of venerating icons. And Basil argued that the images themselves are not what is venerated, but rather the person whom the image depicts. That's, that's who we're venerating, which is the same reasoning the pagans had been using in the 2nd and 3rd centuries. In his letter, 360, Basil said, talking about Jesus and Mary and the apostles and saints, quote, I honor and kiss the features of their images inasmuch as they have been handed down from the holy apostles and are not forbidden, but are in all our churches. He says images are in all their churches. Well, we know that wasn't the case in the second and third century. That, that, that view is not, is not present there in, in anybody who talks about this issue. And we know that wasn't the case over in, in Spain, in the Council of Alvira, earlier in that century, around 300 or 310. But over in the East, where Basil is, it sounds like this is becoming really widespread. All of those earlier Christians that I quoted are unanimously teaching against images, people from Rome, Africa, Egypt, Greece, France, all saying the same basic thing. Now in the fourth century, you have these two views, the historic view, and now a new view that has gained traction, it looks like mostly in the east. From what I've read, it's difficult to nail down when exactly Christians began venerating icons. The Orthodox, of course, say that it was happening from the very beginning, but I'm just talking about historical evidence, both, both archaeological and literary. And it seems like it was a gradual thing that happened. As Christians began making decorative art in the 3rd century, and then somewhere along the way there, in the first half of the 4th century, some Christians began the practice of venerating icons, I guess in the East, and uh, I'm not sure if it's possible to pinpoint when and where and who exactly it started with. So is the veneration of icons part of the faith of the apostles? I really think the answer to that question is very clear. No, this is not from the apostles. 
If the people whom the apostles had entrusted to lead the church could be here today, I think they would tell the Orthodox and Catholics that something's really wrong with this. If Irenaeus was here, I think he would tell them to stop worshiping in the manner of the Gentiles. If there had been at least some Christians in the 2nd and 3rd century who had expressed the view of the Orthodox Church, then maybe I could, I could see you know, making the veneration of icons something that's optional, optional for people whose conscience is at peace with it. But to take a practice that has no scriptural support and which is clearly not the teaching of the pre-Nicene Church doesn't show up until the 4th century. And to make that into an essential doctrine that you have to believe and practice in order to be a Christian and join the church? Man, that is a serious thing. That is not the faith of the apostles. The faith once and for all delivered to the saints, in my opinion. In my next video, I'll discuss the archaeological evidence and what it tells us. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Please let me know if you'd like to discuss these things. And may God bless you, and may he help us all to hold to the true faith of the apostles.